Okay, thank you. <laughs> right, so I'd like to continue discussing the segmentation clock and um, um, <clears throat> I wanted to also just have a tiny prelude today by saying how amazing it is how many uh, people from all over the world are here. So I think I heard that people from 44 different countries are here. Is that right? 34. 34. That's amazing. So I um, just wanted to reach out to um, fellow Australians out there. Is there anyone? Okay. <laughs> okay. Not so unusual. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, um, segmentation clock. Today, so yesterday we talked about the idea of uh, having a genetic oscillator in a single cell. In fact, the idea that those oscillators might be uh, autonomous. And we deliberately ignored questions about what would happen if those oscillators could talk to each other or what would happen if they were organized into larger structures. And today, I want to talk about this, um, what I would call tier two, which is the idea that the cells can talk to local neighbors and share information about their phase. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a quick reintroduction to the general phenomenology. I'm going to talk about synchronization. I'm going to talk about the role of an intercellular signaling system called delta notch signaling in synchronization. Then I'm going to talk about what happens if the, there are delays between the oscillators when they try and share timing information. Uh, and then that will bring us to some period mutants. Uh, and just to give you a, a look ahead, this, in, this idea is that control of the period of, of the, the system can be exerted at the level above a single cell in the collective. So that idea will appear today for the first time. And then um, finish with some open questions. So now just to remind you about the general topic, which is the segmentation of the vertebrate body. Here's an adult zebrafish. And is there anyone who didn't see the talk last night? OK, fine. So we can just highlight the, the key points here then, which are that the body segments of a vertebrate arise during embryogenesis. And they do so in the mesoderm by budding from, they're called somites initially. These segments are formed from several hundred cells. And they bud off rhythmically and sequentially from the tissue in the posterior, which we term the pre-Semitic mesoderm or the, or the tail bud. And so we're interested in this, this rhythmicity and the spatial scale that's constructed along the axis. So we're still focusing on, on rhythmicity today, the timing. So when we, uh, when we, when we focus on that timing, we noticed that the, um, that the period with which the segments form is very reliable in the trunk of the animal. This is one embryo. Um, and here's a population of 15, which I mentioned yesterday. And this is the mean and the standard deviation of the segment formation time through the trunk. So this is kind of important. This precision is important tonight. Remember, yesterday we noted how imprecise the individual oscillators were, how noisy they were. I'm going to come back to this. Um, OK, and then um, we also talked about the idea of the, the general idea of using some sort of clock to measure out space in an embryo. And the idea there was the, this general sort of collection of models, really, called the segmentation clock. And the general mechanism consisting of a, a clock, some population of phase coordinated cells, which are illustrated here by these little um, squares. The idea of phase being the angle on a on the hand of a clock as it describes each revolution. And, um, and then a wavefront, which was the idea that the oscillators can be read out or arrested or read out at some point, And their timing information can be coupled to the movement of the wavefront to yield a periodic pattern, which you can see here. So I, I mentioned that this, this model we call the infinite snake because um, cells are being added continuously here. The wavefront's moving with the same velocity to the end of the tissue, and nothing else is changing. I mean, the, the system is is oscillating, but there's no other time-dependent change in the in the system. So this, and that's important, sort of for everything I say today, that we're talking about some sort of steady-state situation. Tomorrow, I want to go to what happens when the system comes out of steady state. But for today, things are um, at steady state. 
And so this tells us that the segment length is uh, given by the velocity of the wavefront and the period of the clock, which made these predictions about the segment length along the axis and the number of segments that an animal would form using this kind of mechanism. So this, hopefully this is all familiar to you. Now, in, the, in a real vertebrate, uh, such as the zebrafish, the segmentation clock looks something like this. We're tracking this with two transgenes. And again, this green transgene is going to feature a lot tonight. And these waves of gene transcription that are sweeping through the pre-Semitic mesoderm, so waves is tomorrow. Um, but just to note that in order to get a wave, you have to have some sort of coherence, at least at the local level. Otherwise, that would give you salt and pepper pattern, sort of Christmas tree blinking on and off. The fact that you can see waves means that the cells have to be locally coordinated, and that's the topic. Okay, and then and just to say that the, the coherence of these waves is, um, uh, is notable, and you see that the waves, when they arrive in the anterior, they're sweeping from the posterior to the anterior, and when they arrive in the anterior, their arrival marks the timing and position of each of the newly formed segment boundaries. We zoom in, uh, and now looking at a with single cell resolution at the nuclei in the tissue, remembering that the, the transgene we're looking at is a fusion between a YFP and one of the endogenous transcription factors in this, in this clock. And so what we see is the protein entering the nucleus becoming fluorescent. So essentially, the, each nucleus becomes fluorescent. And then the protein is destroyed in the nucleus, so the nucleus becomes dark again. And from here, I, I, think, I hope you can see that the, the waves of, of signals, uh, gene expression sweeping across the tissue, and again, noticing that, the, that there's some, uh, you know, I, I think you can see here that there's some cell-to-cell -cell amplitude difference, um, but that locally the cells appear to be all switching on at the same time and all switching off at the same time when we examine locally. So then we, uh, we had a sort of uh, slightly humorous model of the segmentation clock using this um, signal display asking questions about why an individual pixel would turn on and off, asking questions about why neighboring pixels would be correlated, and finally, which is tonight, and then why, the final question is what gives rise to the global pattern and what might it do? So that's tomorrow. So good. So let's focus our attention now at this level of local synchronization between two cells. And we can motivate that then returning again to say we've got this coherent activity in the tissue um, but the individual cells we, we looked at yesterday were highly noisy. Their periods varied from each other, and their periods even fluctuated uh, within, a, within, a cell, within a cell trace. And so what do you do if you want to coordinate a bunch of uh, noisy oscillators? There's a, a very old concept called synchronization, and that's, that's uh, one of the major topics tonight. So synchronization, so it's an old idea because it was first described, I suppose, in its, what we'd recognize as its current form by Christian Huygens, um, who was hanging out in the 1600s. And he was an instrument maker of some repute. He made clocks, and he made uh, lenses and microscopes. And so um, I went, fam he's famous here because of his clocks. And what he noticed at the time, he was trying to build a precise pendulum clock. And some people credit him with the invention of the pendulum clock. Um, and it's actually very difficult to build a mechanical clock that's precise because parts wear, and it's difficult to make all the parts fit each other properly. And actually, as temperature changes, the parts of the clock expand in, at different rates. And so it's, it's really difficult to make a temperature-compensated mechanical clock. And at the time, Huygens and lots of others were trying to build a very precise clock to be able to measure um, longitude, to be able to sail around the world. You can sail north and south on the globe by looking um, uh, quite simply wherever you are, just by looking at the angle in the the angle that the sun gives above the horizon when it reaches its peak, and that'll give you exactly your degrees um, up from the equator. It's more difficult to know how far east or west you've gone, and the trick that they were trying to use here was to look um, was to know the time in your home port, and then. With this reference clock every day, measure the angle in, of, this, of the sun in the sky at the reference time of noon. And the difference would give you your degrees around the world. Now, if your clock's not very accurate, then you can be hundreds of kilometers away from where you think you are in an ocean. And if your clock's steadily gaining or steadily losing time, the further you sail, the worse it gets. And so lots of people are being killed. Uh, the governments of Europe at the time don't think, I don't think they really cared about that. 
you look at everything else that was going on in Europe at the time, but what they did care about was the enormous loss of, of uh, uh, trade goods. And so this was a, there was a major um, initiative to build better clocks. Right, so in fact, the reason why I'm telling you that long story is because that's the reason that these two clocks are hanging from a beam. Because if you take a pendulum clock on a boat and the boat's rocking, then the, the pendulum's swinging, but the gravitational direction's changing on the, on the clock the whole time. So if you can swing the clock from a beam, to first approximation, the clock stays pointing at the center of the Earth while the boat rocks. Okay, so Huygens built these two clocks in his lab, and they were isolated in the sense that they were on different benches, and he knew that they didn't tick with the same frequency, and he, he knew, he quite accurately described what they did. When he hung them on this beam to prepare them for C, he found that they synchronized. And what happened was the pendula uh, moved into antiphase synchronization like this. Um, and he also found that they now ticked with a common rhythm, uh, and it was much more precise than it was before. So this was uh, extremely exciting to him. He wrote it up uh, in a letter to his father, and he called it the sympathy of two clocks. Now, that was scientific publication in the 1600s. You just write to your dad. But uh, his, his dad saw what was coming, and he rejected it. <laughs> uh, uh, needed major revisions, uh, clearly. So <laughs> actually, the major revisions that were necessary took uh, quite a few centuries to come because it was only... I think it was only a couple of years ago. I mean, you can see demonstrations of this phenomenon on the, 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 the metronome sitting on the Coke cans. I don't know if you've seen this. Look this up on YouTube. It's really, it's really dramatic. But actually building a scale pendulum clock like Huygens built has only been done two years ago uh, by a group of engineers. Um, so, um, okay, so that did take some time to verify. <laughs> okay, that's the joke. And so now let's go back to the science. And so you could sort of illustrate this in some way by saying that coupling between oscillators um, will set a collective period. It will synchronize them to the same period. It will move them into some finite phase arrangement. It could be antiphase or it could be in phase, but the phase between the two oscillators is not going to keep growing. And so you could take a population of oscillators with different frequencies, and once they couple, they'll all line up, and actually they perform an averaging, and the period they'll, they'll pick is actually the average of the distribution. So this is, there's some very, very important theoretical results on this by uh, Kuramoto, for, uh, for example. Um, and, so th and this sort of phenomenon is seen in chemical systems, in physical systems, in engineering, biological systems, the synchronization of the fireflies that, um, that you saw before is, is a good example. So in this case, you take two fireflies, uh, you isolate them from each other, and you see that they tick with different frequencies. You put them together, and now they'll synchronize, and they'll average their frequencies and tick together. OK, so that's the general phenomenon. And uh, currently, we believe that there is a synchron active synchronization. Ah, so what I should say, what's really important here is that synchronization, in the sense that I'm going to use, has a re relatively strict definition, which is that the two clocks ought to be autonomous, and and they can share signals. They can mutually signal. Well, what I'm not talking about is a very strong forcing influence from an external source that drives a slave clock. It's really, it's really we need two, two, uh, two oscillators that are going to talk to each other with, with, a weak, with a weak influence. And I guess in that pendulum clock, the weak influence was the vibration running up across the mount and back in and pushing the escapement to go a bit early. So that's, that's the sense of synchronization that I'm going to use. This is a sort of mutual entrainment, if you like, of, of two clocks. So, what's not the strength of coupling versus how long it takes to synchronize? I mean, is that a Because when I've seen those movies in which you, know, you put them on the clock, it is striking, but it takes a few bits, depending on how out of place they are, but it takes a few bits. But you would think maybe in biology they don't, then I want to synchronize them very quickly. So, I, I was just wondering how strong the one happens. This uh, this depends on all sorts of on all sorts of factors. I guess you can, depending on the model you choose for the coupling, you can you can work it out. I suppose uh, here I don't really know. I have to, have to say I don't actually know the answer uh, in in this case. W what I'll show you in a second is how long it takes the system to desynchronize, and it seems like it takes the system about the same amount of time to resynchronize. But that's in the bulk, and so we don't really know the oscillator-to-oscillator -oscillator coupling strength, which would be expressed in a rate. 
It's the rate at which two clocks can pull them pull themselves towards each other. Um, but w I would say that the but in in this system it looks like the coupling strength is actually quite weak, um, and it's probably an order of magnitude smaller than the other time scales in the system. That give you some some estimate, and, but seems to be okay for the fish. That's enough. Actually, I mean the from theoretical results, and this is not my um, um, main thing, but the um, like Kuramoto for example, showed that uh, infinitesimally small coupling strength will eventually bring uh, uh, oscillators into, into synchronization. So it does depend on how long you've got to wait. In that case, it also depends on your starting condition. If you start synchronized, maybe all you need are little taps to keep you synchronized. If you start with random phase, you maybe need a push to, to get you all into, into gear. The fish starts uh, in, in phase. So, uh, okay, so... This is what we think is happening in the, in the, in the zebrafish. Um, he, imagine each of these black circles is one of the noisy autonomous oscillators that we talked about yesterday. So the, the delta notch signaling system is a, is a, is a set of proteins that, uh, that can send a signal from one cell to another. There's a delta on the surface. It's a, it needs to be transcribed and translated. It's inserted into the membrane. And then it can bind to a receptor called notch, which is in green here. And binding on that receptor pulls it and triggers a set of proteolytic cleavages, which releases uh, its cytoplasmic domain to go to the nucleus. And now the cytoplasmic domain kind of acts like a transcription factor, actually, and goes down and it can influence the activity of target genes and change their transcription. So I'm just gonna give you the cartoon view. There's a whole industry of scientists out there studying all of the different aspects of this, this signaling. Um, and so one other thing to say is that, what well, I'm gonna talk about, I'll use this drug today called DAPT, which can block the cleavage. And it's a very effective way of stopping delta notch signaling. It will diffuse into all sorts of creatures, so, yeah. Sorry, say again. Cell A will... I didn't understand the question. Sorry, man. Can you say that again? Ah, no, they're both. So they're both oscillating. Neither of them are inactive. You're asking whether they're active in inactive states. Uh, okay. So yeah. So um, in the model, in this description, both cells are continuously oscillating. And if you have a look at this pattern here. This is now the tissue level pattern of the expression of this gene, the delta, the signal. So can I animate this? And you'll see what we think. You'll see what the pattern of the activation of this gene is in the tissue. So you remember we saw those waves sweeping through the tissue before, which is an indication of the oscillators. So each time this cell goes through one cycle, it puts delta on its surface and then pulls it off again. So, so there's a pulse of delta on the surface of the cell, and then it goes away again. We think that the cells continuously have notch, and they have more notch than they need. So we, we're not short of notch, but we're limiting for delta, and each cell puts delta on its surface and pulls it back again. Did, did that answer your question? Okay. The dissipative of the of the other of the other. I can't I can't answer that. I actually don't know. Yeah, I mean the whole. This is this in a this is in a something like harmonic oscillators. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the, yeah, uh, that's a good question. I have no idea. I mean, these, all of these cells are massively dissipative. Mm 
So it could be leaking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So these, right. So these, these things are massively dissipative. And I don't know how, I have no idea how they would be leaking the other modes, but I think leakage would be the least of our worries. <laughs> It'd be leaking going on all over the place. But it's good. It's, um, so, okay. So what we, what we have are the cells uh, exchanging information. And if you look at the, the, if you look at the stripe thing here, what you have is cells that appear to be mutually signaling each other. So cells are saying, okay, I, I'm at this phase in my oscillation. I put delta on my surface. And the neighboring cell uh, receives the signal and adjusts the gene expression cycle that it has in its own cell. So, so that's the model that we have at the moment. And I want to show you some of the evidence for this model now. Um, this, of course, is in cartoon form. So the first thing to say is when we add the APT or when we uh, when we mutate any of the delta notch genes, we see a similar phenotype. Um, the fish begins by making what look like normal segments. Uh, they seem to be well formed. And after some time, there is a, a, a failure to segment properly, and the segmental borders become very disorganized. And even though this compound or the mutant was acting at the beginning. So we, we have re independent reason to think that delta notch signaling is being blocked from the very beginning, but it takes some time to see this defect. Now you, when we look at the organizational pattern of the, of the gene expression in the tissue, when the, when the uh, first segments are being made, uh, what I hope you can see here is that we have organized waves. Um, in, these are two different examples of animals that are making their first segments. So it seems like the system uh, is well synchronized, even from the beginning, even in the presence of delta notch, even in the presence of this inhibitor. So the system doesn't need delta notch signaling in order to start in a synchronized state. So that's, that's a fact. But what happens is, over, over time, is the system becomes more and more desynchronized. So by the time the, the fish is making 12 segments, which is about here, um, you can see that the pattern has gone from these uh, well-synchronized stripes into a kind of a salt and peppery pattern of, of gene expression that's scattered along the tissue. And, and by comparison, this is what that tissue would look like at the same stage uh, when we don't add when we don't add the notch blocker. So no delta notch signaling, normal delta notch signaling. So, so what's going on here? Well, it could be that these oscillators are continuing to cycle and they've been desynchronized. But it could be lots of other outcomes. One thing one can do, a very simple experiment, is to cause the animal to desynchronize and then wash out the DAPT. So this has the advantage in a mutant. It's very difficult to bring the mutant gene back. But with this drug, we can wash it out. And this is what happens. The animal undergoes this sort of decay. It makes um, defective segment boundaries. Then we wash out. And then there's a recovery phase. So it was washed out here. And it takes some time until we get good segments again. And when we look at the tissue organization at this point, you can see that the embryos have got their stripe pattern back. So this is consistent with the idea that there's a, that there's a, a, a longer term process, a, a desynchronization process. Then at some point, that wave has become so disorganized it can no longer be used to build a boundary. We wash out. Now the oscillators might start to synchronize with each other, and they gradually gain um, uh, coherence. And then at some point, they are now uh, coherent enough to rebuild a stripe. So this is consistent with this. But what we need to do is we need to actually look at the oscillators. And that's what I want to talk to you next. Yeah. Ah, so, OK, so um, let, let, me say, let me try and say that again. Um, we added DAPT in these experiments before, actually a long time before the first segment was, was formed, uh, actually right back at the stages that Carl Philip was talking about, so before the mesoderm was even formed. And um, I'm not showing this here, but when we do that, the initial cycles of, the, um, of, of these oscillating genes are indistinguishable from uh, animals where they, where they do have uh, delta notch signaling. So, so the, uh, and the reason is, I didn't want to go into this embryology, but the reason is that the genes are initially triggered, their very first expression comes from an outside system. 
uh, comes from nodal signaling or TGF beta signaling, which I think has been will, will be or has been discussed in terms of early early embryonic formation. So, so that first level of coherence, that, that starting point of coherence at T0, if you like, is an external signal. So I wouldn't call that synchronization because it didn't arise by mutual interaction of the oscillators. And then from that sort of from that uniform phase state, if you like, now the system runs, and the idea is that the oscillators, uh, you, they now we now see the their noisiness, and they now desynchronize over time. So the 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 simultaneous start is given by an external signal, and now we just watch the rundown of the of the synchrony. Is that, is that cool? It's, a, it's about 10 cycles from when I add it to when I see the first uh, defect. Um, the fastest I can get that to go is, is, is 10 cycles. When I use some 50 micromolar DAPT, if I come down the concentration, it'll take longer and longer to show me the first defect. Uh, yes, there are there are there are levels of blockade we can put on the animal. We don't see any defects at all. So there's so we I mean from this study we calculated that the coupling strength was probably three or four times higher than the noise, which is surprisingly over coupled. But that's the number we got. Yeah. Very broadly. I didn't show you the distribution of frequencies yesterday when I talked about the single cells. Right. Uh, I, I can show you that. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a unimodal peak. Um, I don't understand if it's too broad or not broad enough. To, uh, it's a good question. Yeah. It's a good question. Okay, um, it does. In fact, it interrupts delta notch signaling throughout the animal. So neurons don't form properly. Uh, the kidneys don't form properly. The gut doesn't form properly. So in specific, the, the, the sort of uh, differentiation of neighboring pairs into alternate fates fails across the embryo. Um, the, the embryo is surprisingly resilient to not getting those numbers right. And in fact, it will survive when we do this. Uh, so DAPT, I, I don't know. We didn't grow these guys up. Um, uh, the delta notch mutants are homozygous viable and fertile. Uh, the, so without going into too much detail, I think one has to be a bit careful there. I think the, the, the uh, development of the embryos are amazingly robust. But we're not, these guys don't have to try very hard to survive because we feed them as much as they can eat and we don't chase them to eat them. So. So small differences in, in, in brain function are going to be lethal out in, the, uh, out in the environment. But in our aquaria, they're, they're fine. So yeah. So, so let's do the experiment now to see whether this idea about the desynchronization, uh, about whether delta notch, so really the question is, is delta notch required for this synchronization? Or uh, sorry, is, is delta notch required for the oscillations at all? Or is it just required for synchronization? Now, you kind of know the answer, because I told you yesterday that the cells can oscillate in vitro, OK, in vitro in the presence of serum and lots of FGF. They can oscillate by themselves. But let's see what happens here. So this is how we do this kind of experiment. Um, we use this kind of recording of the individual cells oscillating in the tissue. And then we pick up a set of cells in the posterior um, that have just about that are, are just entering the presemitic mesoderm. They've come out of the tail bud. They're entering the presemitic mesoderm. And the reason we do that is technical. It's not very interesting, uh, ex except to say that the cells in the posterior are moving around so much. It's really difficult to track them at, at the moment. At least when we did these experiments, it was difficult to, to track them. Whereas the cells settle down as they come through the tissue, and now they're quite easy to catch. And we compare we compare the cells that sit. 
in a line uh, uh, orthogonal to the direction of, of the waves because we want to compare the phases in, the, in a group of cells at the same position in the tissue as they move through the cell. And so we're going to track them from the entry in the tissue to when they exit the tissue into a somite. And this is the kind of plots we get. These are these nine cells here, um, and they seem to be oscillating together. So you can see, you can see a variation in the amplitude, uh, uh, but they're quite well temporally coordinated, and we can, there's a way to measure that with an order parameter that we're going to use. So, um, so what, about, what happens when we add DAPT to the animal? And now I'm going to show you an animal that's had, is, that is grown in the presence of DAPT, and this is now already... Uh, we've waited for quite some time, about 10 cycles after we added in the, the DAPT. And it's quite difficult to see any waves sweeping through that tissue. So I, I don't know if you can see any waves sweeping through the tissue. Um, if you, um, but there seems to be a lot going on. And so if we track those cells, here's the, here's the Case where here's the control animal, and if we track the cells in the DAPT animal, you can see that this, the cells, is the green cell, is still oscillating, still has a, this characteristic rise of amplitude, um, but they're now no longer well coordinated. We've marked the peak in the top here, and here we've marked the peak again. So they appear to be uh, scattered. Their phases appear to be scattered. One can quantitate that in a bit more uh, detail by keeping a running average of the phase uh, along. Across the between the cells and across the across the time. This is important um, uh, to do it uh, the running average across the time, and we can calculate then an order parameter. The order parameter is uh, quite simply done. It's done by saying going back to this idea of the phase of the clock being sweeping around a hand, and you say if we, at a given point in the tissue you superimpose all the clocks, and you add all their hands together, and you divide by the number of clocks you looked at, and if they're perfectly synchronized, your hand will be one. Uh, if they're perfectly unsynchronized, that will go to zero. So that's basically a measure of the, of the phase coherence of all the different oscillators. Now, what we see here, um, it's probably no surprise that the oscillators weren't perfectly uh, synchronized, but we have a non-zero uh, value of the order parameter for DAPT. And I'm going to ask you to belie believe me that that is a consequence of sampling a small number of oscillators. We've simulated sampling increasing number of oscillators. And what, I ex what the, the explanation I just gave to you is true in the limit of enough oscillators to, to really um, cover the circle. So well, that's, that's a long discussion. I think some, there was one like that this morning as well. We're, we're pretty close, actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when, when we got this data, we couldn't. But there's a number of, I mean, it's, you know, there's one, one is continually trying and continually swapping hints and stuff. You have to, it's, it's taken years. And lives have just, you know. <laughs> and, gr and gray hair, yeah. So, um, yes, good. So, um, okay, so, um, so in fact, I'm going to make the claim that from this, from this data set, uh, which is uh, nearly 80 thousand pairwise comparisons between cells. Um, this is actually the expect, for, from these small sample sizes, that's actually the expected order parameter for completely uncorrelated oscillators. So, so we think there's no other coupling force between these cells, at least for, at least for this phase synchronization, for these short, short time scale oscillations. That would be the claim. Now, um, now, this, I'm going to follow up on something that, that you asked me yesterday, which was, what's the difference between the precision of the individual cells and the tissue? And if we, we can... Yeah, sorry. Uh, that's a super question. I mean, um, that... I think we have to accept that delta notch molecules are involved somehow. But do you know when they were first discovered, they were published to be a cell adhesion system. Because if you express delta and notch on two different cell types and you mix them together in dish, they clump together beautifully. These were 
very strongly overexpressed, but still, in fact, you can't ligand another cell without pulling on it in some way, right? So, so I, so I, can make arguments about uh, expressing the cytoplasmic domain inside a cell and seeing a change in gene expression in the recipient oscillator circuit without any pulling on the surface. But I would be brave man indeed to say that mechanical coupling couldn't have anything to do with it. So maybe there are a number of different um, um, uh, ways that information is, is, uh, is, is given between cells. So I think uh, I, I like to th try and think about that. Yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So what is input like sort of having uh, something similar mechanically to a you know, mass spread down, but it doesn't have any such, I don't know, downstream gene regulation for mass spread But there's some of this like, you know, coming. So, so what if we, so what if we, just indulge us here for a sec, what, what if we, instead of driving delta off the promoter that responds to the, the HER gene oscillator, we took the delta out, but we put in something like a coherin, yeah. which would form homotypic binding to the neighbor. Okay. It's a good experiment. Okay, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I, like, I like the experiment, though. I've tried a few cohorts of uh, students to convince them to do that experiment, but no one's, uh, no one's taken up the bait yet. So, um, Precision. So this is one of the things that synchronization can do for you. It can take a population of oscillators with a with imprecise uh, uh, cycles and, and synchronize them and, and make them precise. And so um, what we can do is we can uh, derive a, a phase uh, from, from the intensity trace, um, and then we can look at the uh, autocorrelation function, how that decays, and that will give us a, a, a time constant from the autocorrelation. And we, we define a quality factor as just being this time constant divided by the period. It's, it, and in some ways, it's just how many cycles ahead can you trust? If you're going to catch a bus, how, you know, can I do it four hours ahead? Am I going to be there in the right place? One hour, I better not try and catch a bus in four hours if my quality factor is one. So we could, let me just compare these numbers. I think you were asking yesterday, Stefano, about the, about the difference. And so, um, uh, so the, the bl if we pick the very most precise cells, a set, uh, what we call the persistent cells, um, from the zebrafish, and we plot their uh, quality factors. We, could, we get this distribution here. This, these blue, these blue guys, are the um, are the the best of the individual cells. Now we look at the embryos, just measuring now the collective signal from the tail bud of the embryos, and we get this distribution here. So this is the shift in the medians, and it's it's quite significant. So this is this is a a measure, and I think it underestimates the increase in precision, but it's, it's something that I would feel confident about, about, uh, about saying. It's one thing that, that they can do. So this has all been the zebrafish. And data from other vertebrates has been a bit scarce, but there is now some. And there's uh, some papers uh, just in the last year. And I'm just going to mention them, because I think they, they provide a, a view from another vertebrate. Um, and this is a new system of cell culture from the uh, Alex Aulela's lab at, at uh, Emble. And so, what he's able to do is to dissect off a tail bud from a mouse, and actually it's the very mouse that you saw uh, in Stefano's talk before. Um, not that actual mouse, presumably, but that, <laughs> that, that mouse line. And um, you get the cells out, and you mix them from six different animals, mix all these cells together, plate them in a little, uh, a little bubble, and then they spread out like this, and then uh, the, uh, the, the cells are imaged to detect the transcription of uh, a cyclic gene. It's called a lunatic fringe. What it is doesn't, doesn't really matter. But you could think of it as the equivalent of a, of a HER1 because it will keep track of, of the cells going around this cycle. And um, I, I tried to put the movie in here, but I, I couldn't get it to work. Uh, so what I have got here is a chymograph. And I, if you can see these ridges down this way, those are the pulses of gene expression activity in the culture over time. Um, so, so they're relatively coherent, and that's from a group of cells that initially were co had their phases and frequencies randomly s scrambled. So quite quickly, um, they will synchronize and, and give a sort of almost tissue-level pulsing expression. So go and have a look at the movie from that. You, you'll see these pulses happen. They also organize into these sort of 
uh, concentric rings. Uh, now, um, you can have a look at the a average culture expression, and then when you add, when when they add DAPT, they see the culture average drop away in time. This is time along here, and this is the the uh, sort of collective amplitude that they're getting from measuring a bunch of cells oscillating at the same time. Now, there's two explanations for a reduced amplitude like that. One is the cells have stopped oscillating, and the other one is that they're now no longer oscillating in synchrony, and so you're getting a low amplitude just because you're looking at one of these blinking Christmas trees. And then they, image, then they provide um, a data set consisting of two cells to have a look, and I've showed you them here. Um, and the cell in green, is the, I think you can see three peaks here, that's the one that was grown uh, in DAPT. It, these are cells that are imaged from within one of these cultures. So I think, it's, I think it's more difficult to image cells in this culture than it is in the zebrafish. So I think this is the evidence we have. And I think this is, this is entirely consistent with delta notch signaling performing a similar role in the mouse as it does in the zebrafish. Though I think, I think the uh, jury's still out about how that's going to work in detail. Which one? Yeah, don't shoot the messenger. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. It's not quite clear how they made this plot, so I can't. I can't. Um, I can't give you any more details. I'm sorry. Do you? No? Sorry, I thought you were. I thought you had it. Um, Okay, so let me, I've got my on the time, and what I want to do is, so what's the consequence? If the cells become uh, desynchronized, I already showed you pictures where those uh, embryonic boundaries were, were defective, uh, there's a consequence to the adult animal, and that is that without the arrival of each of these coherent waves, it looks like uh, that the animal can't build its skeleton properly. And so uh, here's a wild-type fish. Here's a mutant that's taken out the delta gene that we were just looking at, and you can see that it's, he, uh, that its neural arches and its hemal arches and its ribs and its backbones are sort of tangled and twisted. Uh, uh, same happened in a mouse, which has lost the same gene. Here's the backbone of the mouse. You can see down here compared to a normal mouse. And this is a human, uh, a baby that's been born with, a, also carries a delta like three mutant uh, mutation and it has, um, uh, and its backbone is also malformed. So this is called congenital scoliosis. And it's the, I'm, I'm using this just to illustrate that. Um, that the, the synchronization of the oscillators has a consequence to the adult anatomy. Okay, so, so that's, that's what I wanted to say about synchronization as a first pass. The next thing that's important to discuss is, is coupling with delays. And so the, the, the premise here is that if two cells are sending each other messages and they're doing it by synthesizing proteins, then that takes some time. Now, if I'm sending a, a signal with a, if a cell sends a signal with a, um, with a protein message and the period is 24 hours, let's say like the circadian clock, then if it takes one cell half an hour to make that protein, then it's effectively an instantaneous transfer of the signal. But if the frequency of the oscillator is on the order of the synthesis time, then we're in an interesting situation where it takes almost as long for, to get a message across as it does to go around a cycle. And that, uh, has consequences. So this is a situation we talked about before, some sort of instantaneous coupling. You think about fireflies. Fireflies are blinking every few seconds, but the speed of light and the speed of neural reception is much, much quicker than the period with which they'll blink. And so you can describe that very well using instantaneous coupling. Um, what happens uh, if there's a, a significant delay in the coupling is that the population can still synchronize. This is theoretical results. Um, now, first pointed out by, uh, by Jung and Strogatz, um, but the population can still synchronize, but they can, they can pick a period that's completely different to the average of the population. And this, this is quite surprising, um, and we're going to, I'm going to dig into that a little more and show you what we think about that. Okay, so, so okay, um, you, can, you can write down this situation of delayed coupling in the following way, and this is work... Uh, that we did to try and think about the oscillators in the zebrafish segmentation clock. And now I'm swapping model completely. I'm not, this is not a model that describes genes and proteins. Uh, it's a phase oscillator model. So here's how it works. We're inspired by these two cells talking to each other. We say, we say that each cell has an autonomous frequency. And so as that changes with time, that gives us the phase, the phase of our, of our oscillators. 
And the cells can talk to each other, and they do so, um, they do so by looking at the, the ith oscillator will look at it, a neighbor at some time in the past. And that's the delay in getting the signal. It always looks at its neighbors in what, what they were doing in the past, and it compares it to its own phase, and then it takes the difference. So this, this approximation of a coupling function by, by sign works well for weak coupling. If it's a very strong coupling, then that fails, and you have to pick some other, some other coupling function. So this is coupling. The delay enters here, and then you, you, the, the, the cell looks at all its neighbors, and then the coupling strength is some sort of prefactor that tells you uh, how, how much that coupling strength works. You could imagine that the delay is the time it takes one cell to make its signaling molecules, traffic them, put them on the surface, and signal. And you can also imagine that the strength might be, for example, the number of events, of interaction events between delta and notch. And that, it's not what we're representing, but that's what it's standing for. That's the kind of coarse graining we're trying to do with this, this model. That's it. Uh, although I think Kuramoto coupled frequencies, but still we're coupling. F yeah. 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 So this is this is homage to Kuramoto. That's where you start. Um, so okay. So now here, um, all the autonomous frequencies are going to be the same. And so if you if now what we of course what you notice were these wave patterns, and I don't want to go into the wave patterns except to say. You might ha we might have to deal with them. Is there a consequence to having the wave patterns there? So we can extend the model by making the, by making the autonomous frequencies have some dependence on spatial position. So imagine you have a, now a 1D chain of oscillators, and they will have some sort of frequency profile that we impose from the outside. This is not ex explaining why there's a frequency profile. It's just imposing it. And here's the consequence. And now, I'm, in some sense, I'm, ju I'm just replaying that first simulation I showed you with the difference being that there's a frequency profile. There's a bit of noise in here as well. OK, so that's, that's, what, I, that's what I did. I introduced a frequency profile and, and the moving boundaries to those previous, previous equations. OK, so what can you do with this? Well, you can let's just play with it first, and we pick a given autonomous period for the oscillator, I'm going to pick 28 minutes for no good reason particularly, but because it's close to what the fish oscillates at, at around about um, uh, 28, 28 degrees, and uh, sorry, 26 degrees. And so now, if you do that simulation with no delay, of your system oscillates with a period that's identical to the frequency of the oscillators in the posterior. So there's, 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 that's exactly the same. Now, let's increase the delay. So now it takes about a quarter of the period to get the signal across, seven minutes out of 28. And you can see the whole system has slowed down. It's made longer segments. Its uh, uh, pattern has changed. This is a simulation result. And now let's just keep uh, increasing the delay now to three quarters of the period. And look what's happened. Um, the, the, the collective period has gone to 23 minutes. So it's now beating faster. Uh, than the autonomous oscillators in the posterior. Uh, with this is now at a coupling delay of 21 minutes. So adding coupling delays into a system of oscillators like this doesn't just slow them down. It depends on, what does it depend on? What does it depend on? It depends, so you can solve that system for the collective frequency. And if you do that, and um, I can't derive that for you, uh, I'd have to cheat from our paper. But this is the result, and I'd ask you to, to follow it up if you like. It's, it says something incredibly simple. It says that the collective frequency with which the system oscillates in steady state um, is given by the frequency of the autonomous oscillators at the posterior end. Remember, they're slowing, so that where they're ticking faster than the posterior, modulated by, the, by this coupling term, coupling strength and a coupling delay times by the collective frequency. So it's a... Um, and you can do some pretty simple um, expectations here. If, I could, if we could switch off coupling, then this whole term would disappear, and the collective frequency would equal the autonomous frequency. So one way to get a look at this is now to say, OK, if this, if this sort of statement is true, oh, sorry, and then I should say, 
the reason why we're changing the, the, changing the collective frequency with increasing delays is because of the sign. So we're getting effects one way and then the other way as the sign function moves with, the, with, the, with, the, um, with its input here. So I'll, I'll show you that in more detail. So, but this is what's giving this periodic effect on the, on the, output, on the output period. So we expect, we'd ex if this is true, if something like this is true, we'd expect an altered period, altered segment length, and altered cellular oscillation patterns. So we can check in the collection of mutants that we have, and we can see that in a mind bomb, which is responsible for trafficking delta, and in which coupling strength is reduced, um, we can see longer segments, uh, and we can see slower, we can see that the, the, the segments form more slowly. Now remember, we just talked about desynchronization. So for these animals, we have to look in the 10 or so segments that form before the system desynchronized. And, uh, and that's what we see. We see that those segments are larger and they form more slowly. We can measure that here. Um, so my length has increased. Um, I, just, I just hinted at that in that previous slide. It's true for all of the delta notch mutants and for the use of DAPT. When we analyze the gene expression pattern, we can see by measuring the wavelength along the tissue, we can see longer wavelengths in an animal with decreased coupling, um, and we can, uh, uh, we, and that seems to be coming from a change in the, in the frequency, uh, sorry, in the change in the collective period and not in the frequency decay length. So that's what you would expect if the collective population had, had slowed down. And um, now we can do that. The next experiment is we can see what happens as we, as we tune the coupling strength. We're doing that with DAPT by using different concentrations of DAPT to block different amounts of notch. And this is kind of similar to what, what you were saying. But now, instead of wait, waiting to see how long it takes for the system to desynchronize, we're going to measure the period with which it beats until it desynchronizes. And you can, maybe, you can see that um, as you add more DAPT, uh, the period slows and then comes to some sort of uh, asymptote. And if we're blocking notch signaling completely here, this term disappears, and now we've found the frequency of our autonomous oscillator. OK, so what is the difference? The difference is about, is about 20%. So let's turn this the other way around. That's to say that when delta notch signaling synchronizes these cells, they speed up by 20%. So that's the effect of, of synchronizing. Uh, is that the whole system lifts, uh, goes faster by about 20%. So now we can get some idea. Let's go back and compare this to the isolated cells because they don't appear to be getting any delta notch coupling. And, and we see that to first pass, we see what we expect. That is that when you pull the cells out of the animal, they slow down. So that, that's the prediction of, of what I just told you, right? But actually, and here's the distribution of the periods, right? Uh, and those periods um, uh, don't change through the culture experiments, so the cells aren't speeding up or slowing down in the culture experiments. But that's, this is very slow. And we, if you take an animal growing at 26, um, we would expect that we, we measured the period to be about 20% longer. But look at, the, look at the period we're getting on our single cells in culture. This is much slower than we expected, and we can't really explain it. So let me, we can't explain this value. Let me go back one step. The first control we did was to just explant the tissue and grow that. So maybe explanting slows things down, and it actually does. If we film the, the oscillations in the tail bud, we can get a period from those experiments. And what we found is that just explanting the tissue slows it down by about one and a half times, so to 42. And now I think probably this is the right comparison to make, is to make a comparison from the explant to the isolated cells. and that. Uh, is still nearly a two-fold uh, slowing. So we can't explain that data by only using the effect of coupling on the cells. There's got to be something else going on when we pull the cells out of the tissue, pull the cells out of the tissue. Oh, explant, sorry. Um, that's this experiment. Uh, sorry, mate, uh, just this experiment. To explant something is to chop it out of the embryo and then put it in culture and then film, film what it does. So, so effectively what we're doing in, in the single cell experiment is we're chopping a piece of the tissue out and then we're dissociating the cells and then we put the cells in culture. So we, in here I'm sort of telling this backwards. I'm saying, well, the first thing we do is we chop the piece out 
So we better know what that period oscillates at, and then we isolate the cells from it. So that's the right comparison and period to make. If we're just looking at the, collect the change in the collective, going from being in the tissue to out of the tissue. So I, I can't explain that. Um, the previous data I showed you suggested that delta notch signaling was the only coupling in the tissue because of the complete loss of phase correlation. But when it comes to the period, which is another prediction of, of, uh, of, syn of the kind of synchronization that we think is going on, uh, we don't get the numbers right. I mean, thankfully it goes in the right direction, but that's still cause, I would say now, that to say we don't understand what's going on. It might be a trivial explanation. It might just be that when you put things in culture, in this case, they're lacking some tonic input onto the promoters of the oscillators. Uh, there, there are a number of... Uh, it might be that the mechanics in the tissue is required to keep the oscillators going at a certain speed. There's a bunch of things that could be. I guess now our, our job is to try and try and get these things to tick faster in a reasonable way to work out what it was we lost when we came out of the, came out of the embryo. Uh, this is, of course, all in the name of um, complete disclosure uh, so that you know what we don't know. Uh, you know that we have a a reasonable description of the behavior in the, act, uh, uh, in the embryo. We have a good, a good, good ability to make some predictions, but some of them, and this might be telling us more about the, uh, the assay system than the, than the coupling, but that doesn't match at the moment. It could be. Yep. Yeah. Do you know? Do you, they they do divide, and it looks like they divide less frequently than cells in the tissue would. So that is consistent with your with that general idea. It could be. It could be. It 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 could it could well be. I I I can't say. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the uh, the universe w moves in subtle ways um, <laughs> that are not immediately accessible on the label. Um, so, so how do I reconcile this? Well, I mean, uh, maybe we've changed their metabolic status because we've pulled them out into a new medium. That's possible. I don't know. Maybe we've changed the mechanics. Um, uh, so, so I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that one way to change the uh, speed of the oscillator. So when, when we talk about the, 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 the period, you may have noticed that I'm often giving things in, in percent change in period. One very, very effective way to change the period of this clock is to change the temperature. The clock produces beautifully formed segments over a temperature range of at least 10 degrees difference over which its frequency goes up threefold. So the whole system can operate over a very wide uh, range of frequencies. And in fact, when we grow embryos at 20 degrees, for example, and we grow embryos at 30 degrees, I'm not sure this is really answering the question, um, uh, we can't tell afterwards what temperature we grew them at because the distribution of segment lengths and the total number and the total length is identical. If we didn't go and check the, the timestamp on the movies, we couldn't actually tell the temperature we were growing at. So... Right, right. So, so that's how they can So, so, so the, so the, um, the system is remarkably r robust to physiologically relevant changes, maybe, like changing in temperature. Um, uh, the, 
I would say the, the most dramatic single change we've seen is the HES6 mutant that I talked about yesterday, because that animal swims around and looks perfectly normal. It breeds. It, you, know, you, couldn't, you would think it was a different species. If you're a field biologist and you pick that animal out of a pond, it has a different number of, of segments, otherwise looks normal as far as we can tell. And so you'd say, oh, look, here's a new Danio species. That's the best, I think that's the best example we've got some, of something that you would say would be a one-step jump that you could consider evolutionary. Everything else we've done, we, we, we've been able to do, has pu pushed the system, and it's, it's gone, but it bites, gone very grudgingly, and then something else is broken while we're trying to do it. Yeah, I, this is the facts, right? I, I, that's where we are. Well, um, that's a really good question. I think the one qu you could try and do a back of envelope there and say, what proportion of the cell's energy budget does it spend on transcription, for example? Uh, and what proportion of all the genes transcribed are these? And so I, I don't know, but I would, I would sort of guess that it's a pretty small fraction compared to maintaining the potential difference across the membranes and da da da. I don't know. Does anyone have a good idea for cellular energy budgets and could help us here? But you didn't invite anyone who knows about I mean, cellular energy I mean, budgets? I mean, if the cells are growing, then the cell that would start from that end would be displayed in new life or something that would be good for it. I don't think this is my kind of view that you're right. amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. If that were to be coming to us, then they need not probably spend too much still because of their source of the mission so that they can sort of divide at the same time. So still they synchronize twice for the second. Okay, I'll, I'll think about that. Yes, sorry. Yeah, yes. Um, there, I think that's a really good question to ask. And when we, when we did the measurements on the, in, when we blocked with the DAPT and we did the, the, the order parameter, we calculated the order parameter on the, on the phases of these cells, uh, and we saw that they had exactly the same number as, the same order parameter as if we had sampled from a population, same number of cells with guaranteed zero correlation. That made me think there's no more phase correlation between these cells. They're really desynchronized. And so that makes me argue that, they, that, that there's, no, there's no other kind of there's no other kind of um, no. There's no other coupling system at work I in the zebrafish. So, but um, in amniotes, for example, so there could be mistakes in that argument. Uh, we could have made the measurements incorrectly. Um, in I show you a picture at the end. Uh, amniotes have th they don't just have delta notch signaling oscillating. They also have Wnt and FGF signaling that appears to oscillate, and those molecules can act at a distance. And it might be that in order to understand synchronization uh, in the amniotes, we need to take into account some sort of long-range signaling. Let me take a step back, too, to say that delta notch expressing cells can reach out phylopods, and they can signal at a distance, too. I, I don't know about across the whole tissue, but certainly back one, back one neighbor. We make lots of approximations saying, OK, it's near neighbor only. But, but there are some systems known where the cells can, can reach, uh, for example, sensory organ precursor formation. In, in flies, so. They can't. Yes, yes, so I think the, the message is that, so I, I think that when we look at the individual cells, they have, they have no input, no delta notch signaling at all that's not being stimulated at all, that pathway. When they come together, now they can receive delta notch signaling, and two things happen. One is they become synchronized, and the other is they speed up uh, because, of, because of the delays in the coupling. So th that's what I think is going on. I think that's, what, that's the picture that this, that this evidence paints. Yeah, that's a good question. So that's going to be one of my open questions at the end. 
So it's a really good question. It's whether delta notch signaling is directional in the tissue, could it be that there's a delta notch wave that sweeps down the tissue and triggers, triggers this wave? I'm going to come to waves tomorrow. And I will, I will, I promise to try and tackle that, try and look at that question. But let's try and stay in this local neighborhood for today, if that's acceptable. <laughs> Bad luck if it isn't, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I know I could swap to the, the, the other lecture. OK, so um, right. So, so we've, got a, we've got a quantitative gap between our cell culture experiment and our expectations from in vivo. I'm not quite sure. Is that the end of the theory? Have we got it all completely wrong? Or is, do we need to, is there something else we're missing? We need to tweak the, the cell culture experiment. So that's, I leave that there. Now, what I wanted to do was plot the solution space for this equation because it's really interesting and what we can plot here is the collective period so uh, not the frequency but but the collective period on this axis here's the period this yellow line marks the period with which the autonomous oscillators would tick and of course that's also the collective period uh, when we add DAPT so I've got coupling is zero here and if you've got zero coupling it doesn't matter how long your delay is. You're not sending a signal. You don't care. It's irrelevant. That's why that, that's why that line is flat. And now, as, you, as the delta notch coupling increases, as the coupling in the model increases more specifically, this flat line buckles, and it starts to rise up. And now you see the, the, the sign. And this is, part of, this is the explanation of why you can both speed up and slow down, depending on the ratio of the delay to the period. So. Um, we think that the fish, we, we know that the fish speed up when they couple, and we know they slow down when they uncouple. So that's to say that, that they've got to lie down here somewhere under the line. And if we, we, know that, we know the amount of time that's different. And so we're looking for, for some stable part of the solution to sit on. And so we think that the fish is probably here, if that, if that makes sense. We, we, we don't think it can be longer, because this, the solutions that we get are multi-stable. And that's not going to be a good evolutionary strategy to keep a system ticking stable. So we're, we, want, we, we think the system ought to sit somewhere where it's monostable. We actually had a measure of the coupling strength from those decay experiments where we measured how long it took for the system to desynchronize. I'm not going to go into that, but we think it's about this amount. And so if your coupling strength is, is this high, 0 0.07 per minute, then this, is the, this black line is the, is the branch that you would be sitting on. Now, this dotted line. This dotted line sits at um, where the delay um, is pi of the period. So exactly halfway through the period, the system is not stable. So as you, in, as you increase the delay, the system slows down. That's what you saw in that first simulation. And then the system becomes unstable. And then as you increase it further, the system becomes stable again. But now the system's ticking faster. And then as the delay approaches the period again, you go back to to sitting as if there was no delay in the coupling anymore. Right, so if we're here, can we decrease the delay and hit the instability? This is a question. Are there instabilities that we can find? And these instabilities ought to be distinct from desynchronization. This instability will have a, a hallmark of being uh, antiphase. So the cells will be, well, won't be able to settle down in phase and they'll be continually perturbing each other. And we Tried to do that experiment by overexpressing this enzyme called MindBomb. I showed you the mutant for that a minute ago. And it's an enzyme that influences the rate at which delta is trafficked and become, can become ready to signal. So we thought, well, maybe if we overexpress this guy, we'll put delta on the surface more quickly, and that might have the effect of shifting us towards uh, this instability. And now I'm going to show you what happened when we did that experiment and how we interpreted it. Here's the, here's the wild type uh, experiment. This is a snapshot of the wave pattern in, the pre, in one arm of the pre-Semitic mesoderm of the, of the wild type. And when we simulate that using that theory uh, on a hexagonal lattice, this is the kind of pattern we get. And we look at the correlation function of the stripes along the axis. And so the, the, the real data comes in the thick line, and the theory is in the gray line. So this is a good, a good match. And it kind of says that we've got at least some idea of what the parameters are to get the delayed coupling theory to match what the fish embryo is doing. Now we overexpress MindBomb, and we see that, that the tissue um, loses the coherent stripe pattern, 
but it doesn't become smoothly salt and peppered like the loss of coupling does. I'm not showing you that data. You, sh you saw some examples before. And rather, it has these areas of, of, of alternating high and low cells. And we think that that fits quite well to, um, to the delay, uh, to, in the simulation, to a delay of about 17 minutes. So these oscillators haven't been imaged directly, so I would consider this indirect evidence. But it says that, uh, but it suggests that by pushing, by shortening the delay and moving us in this direction, we can find a state of oscillator uh, pattern that is neither synchronized nor desynchronized. It's in some sort of uh, antiphase opposition state. So, okay, so that's, that's, um, that's constants of changing the delays. Okay, so let me um, finish up the bit on the zebrafish here. And I think that the main, the, the core message here uh, on signaling, on synchronizing with delays, is that if the delays are on the same order as the period, you can't neglect them. And depending on whether they're shorter or longer than half the cycle time, uh, you can either slow down or speed up the system. And so if we're thinking about this segmentation period, like yesterday I was, I was saying, look, we need to think about all the time scales in this loop. That's how we will get the magic prize. When we understand that time scale, we will we'll be able to understand it. And I think um, James was saying, well, how come you're so hopeless at understanding the period? And I said, well, maybe it's because one idea would be that there are other things going on that just aren't described in the single cell. And so we need to look at And this might be one example. So that I will argue that the, that the period that the system gives rise to, um, uh, of course, has input from this, these time scales, but is modulated by this level. It's synchronized, but the period itself is also changed. So the final period of somitogenesis is an emergent property that comes from the way the cells synchronize. Okay. So, um, so I've got about a quarter of an hour assigned left. And if people give me some indication of oxygen levels, uh, I, can, I can discuss, uh, I think, one more experiment that was done in the mouse and that altered delays. Another attempt to alter delay and see what happened. OK, I can see some metabolic activity. It's <laughs> good. Yeah? OK, right. -o. So now, <clears throat> this is a paper that came out recently. And so I, I guess you can see what I'm doing. I'm saying I'm trying to tell you what I think we know. But I'm also putting in papers that just came out and that I, I don't understand yet. I, I'm not, I haven't really. I don't really understand them, but I think it's important to look at the data because th it's new stuff, and we, we need to sort of incorporate this and think about how, how it fits in. So this is a paper uh, from Ryuchiro Kageyama's lab, and Hiromi Shimojo was the first author. And she made, uh, she made a reporter of delta like 1 in the mouse. So she could see, the, she could see this delta promoter making uh, luciferase, and so when she imaged the presemitic mesoderm of the cell, uh, of, the, of the mouse embryo, uh, she, got a, she got expression in the, in the presemitic mesoderm. And when she ran a measurement window along the presemitic mesoderm, she got a, a, a time-space diagram, a chymograph of oscillations like this. So time's going this way. These pulses are the successive oscillations. And the curvature in that, in that uh, yeah, in, in that uh, line there is, is the wave moving forward. So we'll come back to waves more tomorrow. And then uh, she says, OK, well, I can. She puts another measurement line across that way. And now she picks out the period with which those pulses are happening in the tissue. So it looks like that's a good way to. So this is now uh, a live notch reporter. OK, so um, you can look at this as uh, evidence that notch is oscillating in the mouse. Uh, now the question was, uh, can they change the delay in delta signaling to the neighbors? And they tried to do that in two ways. One was to, to take away the endogenous. So the, the endogenous delta gene is about eight kilobases long. And remember yesterday we were discussing how you might change the uh, production delay in a gene by cutting out introns was, was one idea. Um, so if you put more introns or make the gene longer, you should take longer to produce the gene. And so that's, that's the trick they did here. Um, the first version, what they call type 1, they deleted the endogenous gene and just expressed the, the, the cDNA. So that's basically a piece of DNA that has no introns in it. It encodes the protein directly. 
and it's much shorter. Um, and then uh, the, the other type of mutant they made was they, they added, they inserted this uh, cDNA um, upstream of the endogenous gene, and so they made the whole gene longer. And they went to tissue culture, and this time using a uh, blue light inducible um, promoter, which we were discussing briefly yesterday, they shone blue light on the cells to trigger the expression of these genes, now from, from a, a light-sensitive promoter, not from the endogenous promoter. And then they, they measured the increase of um, luciferase fluorescence over time. And here is the wild type in green. The, uh, the, the blue is the type 1 mutant, so it's, it's being produced faster. It's coming up earlier. And the, um, and, he, and the red is the type 2 mutant, so it's coming up slower. And they estimated that, um, that the version without any introns was being made about six minutes earlier than the wild type. And the version with the extra uh, uh, cDNA at the front was being made about six minutes slower than the difference. Now, remember that six minutes uh, should be now compared to the two hours, approximately, that the mouse cycle takes. So these are quite small changes. These are sort of on the order of, what, 5% or something? OK, so, so that's the experiment. And now um, uh, uh, Hiromi made transgenic animals with both, of these, um, with both of these transcription factors now replacing the endogenous delta. And this is what happened. Um, both of them broke the segmentation clock. So here's a wild type uh, trace looking at the, um, the pulses in the tissue over time. And this, I'm only showing here the type 1 mutant, the, the one that's ready too early. Um, here, yeah, maybe, maybe these are real oscillations. Maybe not. It's not clear. Hiromi didn't think that that was a reliable uh, periodic measurement. And so in this paper, they make the argument that there is a very narrow window, and this speaks to exactly what we were discussing. There's a very narrow window of production delays that the system can tolerate. If the delta gets there too early or gets there too late, then coupling doesn't work. And even though they showed that the, the proteins were being expressed at comparable physiological levels, um, and they also know that that cDNA will, will rescue, so there's nothing wrong with the cDNA itself, um, just changing the delay was enough to stop the coherent oscillations in, in the clock. James. Uh, you do, yeah. So it doesn't have a dominant negative. Yeah. Whereas the other one did. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I think it means that if you can signal with the right time scale, it doesn't matter if you've got some distribution to your delay. It's actually one of the open questions I had was about the distribution of the delays, whether you have a hard delay or you, or you have a, uh, some distribution to your delay. That theoretically can affect the communication. But what I would say here is that this essentially means you've got your wild type protein. Okay, let, let's imagine the wild type protein imagines on, uh, arrives on time. Uh, but there's also a little, there's, there's some arriving early, but then there's some arriving on time. And the system appears to be OK. There was no analysis of whether the period had changed, um, but it, it still oscillates in, in, a coherent, in a coherent manner. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. They, I need to go back and double check, but this is the evidence that they, they presented, and I don't know if, like in the previous cases we are talking about, you mean where the system starts out OK, and then after some time it, it, it decays. Um, I don't know. Let me look. Yeah, so if it were, I think this is, again, a good open question, which is, is the coupling really symmetrical? Uh, it, so if you have a, it, the way we write the coupling down, it doesn't matter when in the cycle, right, you couple. But if you really po pulse coupling, then it might matter. If I pulse with delta, um, then I might use up all the notch. OK, I argued in the zebrafish notch is not limiting, but I don't know in the mouse. Um, uh, and then maybe, maybe it does matter. The other thing is that um, if 
if notch uh, is acting to couple to the oscillating circuit in the neighboring cell by transcriptional activation, then if I signal early, I've already started, I've already started expression on, the, on those promoters early. Now I put more later, they're already going. Maybe the average hasn't shifted far enough here, but it has shifted far enough here. Yeah, I, I agree. That makes sense. Sorry, say that, say that again. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Let me. Um, yeah. So by coupling, I guess I'm. I guess we're. I have to be careful here because I've been using coupling as synonymous with delta notch signaling. Uh, coupling is really any communication, in some sense. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. Um, um, uh, so would you like to ask your question again, given that I'm trying to clarify coupling? I yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, if if it's got a receptor on the surface, sort of biochemically, if it has a receptor, it'll it'll trigger it ought to trigger some biochemical change within the cell. And whether that's interpretable to the cell will depend on, uh, I guess, the composition of signal transduction molecules inside, and potentially also whether the relevant promoters, uh, if we're talking about a signal to a gene, are, um, are active or not. And so, so I think it's a good question. Um, um, we, for example, we don't have a phase response curve for this system. We don't know when 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 in the cycle so just take so take a coupling away we, uh, the promoter produces a lot of her, her or his protein that comes back into the nucleus and now let's say is in excess and that promoter is now shut down it's repressed now um, it may be that if I deliver a notch signal at that time point there's nothing that the cytoplasmic domain of the notch receptor can do because the the, uh, the stoichiometry of the molecules around the promoter is dominated by the repressors. So there may only be a window within the cycle where um, uh, a notch signal makes sense to the cell. Does, is, that, is that anywhere, does that make sense? Okay, righto. I don't know if that's right, <laughs> but okay, yes. So, good, okay, so, yeah, so the discussion here is that that in the paper it's discussed that there's some very narrow stability window and if you move slightly outside that window the system shuts down and so this again we're back to this sort of discussion about why is it so hard to change the period of a biological oscillator I think that's a really good question I don't have an answer for it so let me just summarize now in the last couple of seconds and say what I've tried to discuss with you today is the idea that these neighboring oscillators communicate that in the, in the zebrafish and probably also in the mouse, delta notch signaling is not, a, not only involved but potentially uh, required. Uh, the own, maybe it's the only communication. Synchronization overcomes noise, and I would say that's its, in some sense, that's its primary function in the animal is to make sure that oscillators are coherent to produce the boundaries. But it also has the effect, the, the delays in these coupling appear to tune the period. So this, this you sort of get for free. Um, uh, there's some papers to, to read here if you're interested. And then, so there's plenty of open questions. And actually, these have come up, uh, I think nearly all of them have already come up in questions. Um, all of our models assume that the, the cells signal to each other symmetrical, and the symmetry is a bit deeper because with a coupling function like that I showed you, the cells are in communication all the way around the cycle. But it's not clear that either of those things are true. It could be that. One cell sends a signal and then the other cell replies. 
Uh, it could be that if one cell has more delta on its surface, it dominates the conversation and there's not much coming back. Um, we don't know about how the delays really work. We haven't measured them directly. We've only estimated them for using the models. Um, what, what difference would a distribution in the delay make? And I think that's an interesting question. And what, what's the coupling strength? And this is the question you asked at the beginning. How long would it take? So now let's get simple. And now maybe we can do an experiment like this. We can take two cells out of the segmentation clock and let them come in to touch each other. And you can see these two cells have touched each other. And they've formed a kind of a, a, a surface where they're in close contact. And now play the, play the movie. It's going to loop. Can you, can you see that what's happening is that the two cells are oscillating first the right, then the left, then the right, then the left, right? So it's exactly the opposite that we've been talking about all, all evening. In the tissue, the cells always synchronize in phase. But sometimes, sometimes when they come together in the dish, they also synchronize in phase, but sometimes they synchronize out of phase. And so, uh, so I think this is going to be super fun to play with these cells and try and work out what the minimum rules are. Now, away from the rest of the tissue, away from the gradients, which we'll talk about tomorrow, da -da, what do two cells do when they touch each other? And maybe we can then, by tagging the delta, get some idea of how long it takes a, a, a cell to send a signal. Yes. Right. This is the walkie-talkie model. David Springzak's paper when he was in uh, uh, Mike's lab. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, are, are, the, are these are these walkie-talkies? Are they talking to each other continually like Italians or you know what what <laughs> or Indians? <laughs> what's you know what's what's going on there? And so maybe this is the way to at least ask those questions uh, in, in a different way. Um, I, I'm still curious about what's happening in amniotes, and now I'm, this is the picture I promised to show you later. This is a sort of sketch about how many genes in the FGF pathway and the WINT pathway are thought to be oscillating. Um, and in contrast, in the, in the zebrafish, as far as we know, only delta and the HES-HER are oscillating. So maybe, and this comes back to something I said at the beginning yesterday, maybe one advantage of studying in the zebrafish is not just the imaging, but also that for some reason, maybe the system is really stripped down. And maybe we get a look at some of the core dynamics without all of the, the sort of large-scale molecular activity. That's all I wanted to say about synchronization. Tomorrow, we're going to look at the tissue-level wave pattern. Okay, thank you very much.